going to read the sutta through now. It's not really that long. And, but if I sent you papers and uh, on the papers, I think the notes are probably the same as I wrote down as I was doing this earlier. <clears throat> what this is going to talk about are the, the purifications that you want to complete in order to get to the level of reaching the super mundane Nibbana. This is what this is actually about, okay? Now, the purification that, that is in this sutta, there are seven pieces. There are six pieces that are conditional in life, meaning like you think of dependent originates, all conditional in order for it to happen. Nothing happens without a condition, okay? And the last piece is unconditional and that's Nibbana. Uh, it's a funny term to say that Nibbana is unconditional to me. When I finished this, you tell me what happens to you when you listen to this. But the reason I'm saying the state itself is unconditional, I agree. But it's a funny thing because when you think about it in order to reach cessation and experience Nibbana, there is a prerequisite condition that must be reached for that to happen, isn't there? So actually to experience, to get there, definitely it, it has a condition relation, conditional relationship, but once there, it's unconditional. And we'll talk about that at the end a little bit. So the first one, they had these seven, you're gonna hear them. I want you to hear them first before we go through, okay? So the first one is purification of virtue. That's the sila, visuddhi. Visuddhi means purification. So purification of the virtue. And um, the second one is purification of mind, the chitta visuddhi, overcoming the five hindrances through, I'm going to say, samatha and vipassana. In the text, in the notes in the book, it says vipassana, insight and vipassana, okay? I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say samatha and vipassana because that's how we're getting there. In the third one, um, the purification of view, the didi vasudhi, understanding the uh, and defining the nature of the five aggregates. And this includes shifting your mind from anatta to anatta. So, and taking things less personally than taking them personally. The next one is over, that's the Ditti, Ditti Vasudhi. And then uh, purification of overcoming doubt. Uh, this one is Kankha Vitarana Vasudhi. That's doubt, overcoming doubt or purification your mind with doubt. Now, remember you go too far into uh, Sotapanna, one, one of the things that is removed is doubt. That falls off. That's what the top three, uh, bottom three, or worst top three, I say top three fetters, okay? One of those is give, no more doubt, okay? Uh, the purification of uh, the uh, knowledge of knowledge and vision. Now this happens twice in here, it's real interesting. Purification of knowledge and vision, the first one of what is path and what is not path. This is talked about in the suttas in various places because if you're on path, you begin to understand what is not path. Or if you find what you think, this is really what he must have been practicing and you have no doubt, you realize what wasn't. And, the, and you realize most of the time when you find, identify not path, okay? It's because it, you weren't moving down the path. So to me, everything comes back to operational or not operational regards to the path. Maga, magana, nadasana, visuddhi. Okay, the correct discrimination between the false path of the ecstatic, um, exhilarating experiences uh, and the true path of insight into anicca, dukkha, and anatta, seeing anicca, dukkha, and anatta very clearly. And I really like the way they're talking about that one in the notes because with our practice, we really do experience every time you do the six R's, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. We understand what dukkha is. We understand the hindrances are always, always temporary. They're always 
hooked into a Nietzsche. So it's a matter of why is this happening to me? It doesn't make sense because whatever it is, it's going to change. So this is internalizing, internalizing anatta and internalizing the impersonal nature and the, the fact it's going to change. Okay. Next one is the um, purification of the by knowledge and vision um, of the way. Now, now, when they say the way here, it's telling me it's meaning the eightfold path <clears throat> and using the whole entire eightfold path functionally in life helps you to be in a position where you can be able to support your practice comprises the ascending series of insight knowledges. We're going to let that go of the super mundane path. But if we looked at those insight knowledges, which I did one time, <laughs> it was a very funny thing because Bhante came in one morning and said to us, you know, I'm a Vipassana teacher. And we said, you are not a Vipassana teacher. <laughs> and he said, yes, I am. Have you had any insights since you have been practicing this way? And we said, what do you mean? And he asked us the questions and we had seen all of these insights that they talk about. But the funny thing about it was we were not dividing everything up and attempting to see one and attempting to see the next or the next, but we had the answers for seeing all of these naturally. That's what was interesting to me. Okay, and that's the Nana Dasana Visuddhi. And that's, so this is the first six and conditional, and then Nibbana has not arisen through any kind of condition, an unconditioned state. And I take issue with the way that was written, like I was just saying earlier, because you had to leave the building, go into anatta frame of mind, let everything go in order to get there to experience cessation. All right, so now listen to the sutta, okay? This is the uh, Majima Nikaya number 24, the Rata Vinita Sutta, the Relay Chariots. And you have to listen really carefully because you can get very tangled up on this. Wait a second. <clears throat> okay. Thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. When a number of monks from the Blessed One's native land who had spent the rains treat, rains, uh, there, rains retreat there, went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, sat down on one side and the Blessed One asked them, monks, who in my native land is esteemed by the monks there, by his companions in the holy life in this way? Having few wishes himself, he talks to the monks on fewness of wishes. Being content himself, he talks to the monks on contentment. Being secluded himself, he talks to the monks on seclusion. Being aloof from society himself, he talks to the monks on aloofness from society. Being energetic himself, he talks to the monks on arousing energy. Attained to virtue himself, he talks to the monks on the attainment of virtue. Attained to a balanced, productive concentration himself, he talks to the monks on the importance of the attainment of a balanced, con productive concentration. Attained to wisdom himself, he talks to the monks on the attainment of wisdom, which means understanding the dependent origination. Attained to deliverance, himself, he talks to the monks on the attainment of deliverance. Attained to the knowledge and vision of deliverance himself, he talks to the monks on the attainment of the knowledge and vision of deliverance. He is one who advises, informs, instructs, urges, rouses, and gladdens his companions in the holy life. 
So this is a lesson on how should we seriously pursue this as a meditator and how should we be teaching it as a teacher. Venerable Sir, the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta is so esteemed in the Blessed One's native land by the bhikkhus there, by his companions in the holy life. Now on that occasion, the Venerable Sariputta was seated near the Blessed One. It occurred to the Venerable Sariputta it is a gain for this venerable Puna Mataniputta. It is a great gain for him that his wise companions in the holy life praise him point by point in the teacher's presence. Perhaps sometime or other we might meet this venerable Puna Mataniputta and have some conversation with him. And then when the blessed one had stayed at Rajagaha as long as he chose. He set out to wander by stages to Sawati and wandering by stages, he eventually arrived at Sawati and there he lived in Jetta's Grove and Apapindika's Park. The Venerable Puna Mantanaputta heard that the Blessed One had arrived at Sawati and is living in Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park. And then the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta set his resting place in order and taking his outer robe and bowl, he set out to wander by stages to Sawati. Wandering by stages, he eventually arrived at Sawati and he went to Jetta's Grove, Anatha Pindika's Park to see the Blessed One. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he sat down at one side and the Blessed One instructed, urged and roused and gladdened him with talk on the Dhamma. And then the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta instructed, urged, roused and gladdened by the Blessed One's talk on the Dhamma, delighting and rejoicing in the Blessed One's words he rose from his seat after paying homage to the Blessed One, keeping him on his right. He went to the blind men's grove for the day's abiding. And then a certain monk went to the Venerable Sariputta and said to him, friend Sariputta, the bhikkhu, Puna Mantaniputta, of whom you have always spoken so highly has just been instructing, urging, rousing and gladdened by the blessed one with talk on the Dhamma. After delighting and rejoicing in the blessed one's words, he rose from his seat and after paying homage to the blessed one, keeping him on his right, he has gone to the blind men's grove for the days abiding. So it was that Venerable Sariputta hurriedly took his sitting cloth and followed close behind the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta, keeping his head in sight. And then the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta entered the blind man's grove and sat down for the days abiding at the root of a tree. The Venerable Sariputta also entered the blind man's grove and sat down for the days abiding at the root of a tree. And then when it was evening, the Venerable Sariputta rose from meditation and went to the Venerable Punas Mantaniputta, exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and he said to the Venerable Puna Mantaniputta, is the holy life lived under our blessed one friend? Yes, friend. But friend, is it for the sake of purification of virtue that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification of mind that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. 
then is it for the sake of purification of view that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification by overcoming doubt that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification of knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification of knowledge and vision of the way that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Then is it for the sake of purification by knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? No, friend. Friend, when asked, but friend, is it for the sake of purification of virtue that the holy life is lived under the blessed one? You replied, no, friend. And when asked, this is for the sake of purification of mind, purification of view, purification of overcoming doubt, purification of knowledge and vision of what the path is and what is not the path, and purification of knowledge and vision of the way, purification of knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived under the blessed one, you reply, no, friend. For the sake of what then, friend, is the holy life lived under the blessed one? And clinging that the holy life is lived by the blessed one. But friend, purification of virtue, final nibbana, without craving and clinging, no, friend. Then is purification of mind and final nibbana without clinging? No, friend. Then is purification of view final nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. Then is purification of overcoming doubt final nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. Then is purification of knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path, final Nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. Then is purification by knowledge and vision of the way final Nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. Then is purification by knowledge and vision final Nibbana without craving and clinging? No, friend. But friend, is final Nibbana without craving and clinging to be attained without these estates? No, friend. When asked, but friend, is purification of virtue final Nibbana without craving and clinging? You replied, no, friend. And when asked, then is purification of mind and purification of view, purification of overcoming doubt, purification by knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path, purification by no knowledge and vision of the way, purification by knowledge and vision, final Nibbana without craving and clinging, and you replied, no, friend. And when asked, but friend is final Nibbana without clinging to be attained without these states, you replied, no friend. But how friend should the meaning of these statements be regarded? Ah, friend, if the blessed one had described purification of virtue as final Nibbana without craving and clinging, he would have described what is still accompanied by craving and clinging as final Nibbana without clinging. If the blessed one had described purification of mind without clinging, he would have described what is still accompanied by 
craving and clinging as final Nibbana without clinging. And purification of view it is so, and purification by overcoming doubt, purification by knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. Purification by knowledge and vision of the way. Purification by knowledge and vision as final Nibbana without craving and clinging. He would have described what is still accompanied by clinging as final Nibbana without clinging. And if final Nibbana without craving and clinging were to be attained without these states, then an ordinary person would have attained final Nibbana. For an ordinary person is without these states. But as to that friend, I shall give you a simile. For some wise men, they understand the meaning of a statement by means of a simile. Suppose that King Pasanadi of Kosala, while living at Sawati, had some urgent business to settle at Saketka. And that between Sawati and Saketa, seven relay chariots were kept ready for him. And then King Pasanadi of Kasala leaving Sawati through the inner palace door would mount the first relay chariot and by means of the first relay chariot, he would arrive at the second relay chariot. Then he would dismount from the first chariot and mount the second chariot. And by means of the second chariot, he would arrive at the third chariot where he would dismount from the second chariot and mount the third chariot. By means of the third chariot, he would uh, arrive at the fourth chariot. And then dismounting from the third chariot, he would get into the fourth chariot and he would follow by means of the fourth chariot, he would arrive at the fifth chariot. And by means of the fourth, fifth chariot, he would arrive at the sixth chariot. By means of that sixth chariot, he would arrive at the seventh chariot. And by means of the seventh chariot, he would arrive at the inner palace door at Saketa. So then when he had come to the inner palace door, his friends and acquaintances, his kinsmen and relatives would ask him, sire, did you come from Sawati to the inner palace door in Saketa by means of a relay chariot? How then should King Pasanadi of Kosala answer in order to answer correctly? In order to answer correctly, friend, he should answer this. Here, while living at Sawati, I had some great urgent business to settle at Saketa. Between Sawati and Saketa, seven relay chariots were kept ready for me at all times. And then leaving Sawati through the inner palace door, I mounted the first relay chariot. By means of the first relay chariot, I arrived at the second relay chariot. And then I dismounted from the first chariot and mounted the second chariot. And by means of the second chariot, I arrived at the third. And then I dismounted from the second chariot and I got into the third chariot. And that is how I reached the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and seventh chariot. And by means of the seventh chariot, I arrived at the inner palace door in Siketa. In order to answer correctly, he should answer thus. So too, friend, purification of virtue is for the sake of reaching purification of mind. Now here's the connection. When you have your list notes, if you follow the list we made, now there's another, another line. And each one is for the sake of the next one. So we have another dependent line, just as in dependent origination, cause and effect, conditional for the next act to purify. 
Purification in virtue is for the sake of pure, reaching purification of mind. Purification of mind is for the sake of reaching purification of view. Purification of view is for the sake of reaching purification of overcoming doubt. We cannot overcome doubt unless we are looking carefully with an anatta perspective. We have to have an anatta perspective that we are seeing through. Then we overcome doubt. We see the actual practice operating correctly. Purification of overcoming doubt is for the sake of reaching purification of knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path. Purification of knowledge and vision of what is the path and what is not the path is for the sake of reaching purification of knowledge and vision of the way. Knowing by seeing, knowing by seeing his method of teaching, not sitting and waiting and breaking and then going to insight and saying, okay, now I know. Seeing it occurring, the connection, okay? Purification by knowledge and vision of the way is for the sake of reaching purification of knowledge and vision. Purification by knowledge and vision is for the sake of reaching final Nibbana without any craving or clinging. It is for the sake of final Nibbana without clinging that the holy life is lived under the blessed one. So now he gives his reason. It is for the sake of this. It is the ultimate goal, the ultimate objective. When this was said, the Venerable Sariputta asked the Venerable Puna, Mantana Putta, what is the Venerable One's name and how do his companions in the Holy Life know this Venerable One? My name is Puna, friend. My companions in the Holy Life know me as Matana Putta. And Puna's mound that he is buried in is out an hour away from uh, Deepakar, where I was outside of Mumbai. It's only within about an hour from here. There's not a tremendous amount left of the mound that his ashes were put in, but it, they know it was Pune's and it is, you know, fenced off. It's not like a national site. It's not a big deal, but it, it, the mound is there still. The rest, of, uh, they didn't go inside or anything. My name is Puna and the companions in the holy life know me as Matana Puta. It is wonderful, friend. It is marvelous. Each profound question has been answered point by point by the venerable Puna Mantana Puta. As a learned disciple who understands a teacher's dispensation correctly, it is a gain for his companions in the holy life. It is a great gain for them that they have the opportunity to see and honor the venerable Puna Mantana Puta. Even if it were by carrying the venerable Puna Mantana Puta about on a cushion on their heads that his companions in the holy life would get the opportunity just to see and honor him. It would be a great gain for them, a great gain for them. And it is a gain for us, a great gain for us that we have the opportunity to see and honor the Venerable Puna Mantana Putta. When this was said, the Venerable Puna Mantana Putta asked the Venerable Sariputta, what is the Venerable One's name? How do his companions in the Holy Life know the Venerable One? He didn't know this was Sariputta that he had the discussion with. This is a big deal, you know. Number one teacher, the mother. This is Sariputta, the mother of the school. Remember, Mogalana is the nurse, and this is the mother of the school. My name is Upatisa, friend, and my companions in the holy life know me as Sariputta. Indeed, friend, we did not know that we were talking with the venerable Sariputta, the disciple who is like the teacher himself, 
if we had known that this was the venerable Sariputta, we should not have said so much. It is wonderful, friend, it is marvelous. Each profound question has been posed point by point by the venerable Sariputta as a learned disciple who understands the teacher's dispensation correctly. It is a gain for his companions in the holy life. It is a great gain for them that they have the opportunity to see and to honor the venerable Sariputta. And even if it were by carrying the venerable Sariputta on a cushion on their heads that his companions in the holy life would get the opportunity just to see and honor him, it would be a gain to them, a great gain for them. And it is a gain for us and a great gain for us that we have the opportunity to see and honor the Venerable Sariputta. Thus it was that these two great beings rejoiced in each other's good words. That's the end of the sutta. So this, again, these parts turn out to not just be six parts and the seventh part, okay? They turn out to be conditional, okay? And we were saying earlier, we were saying when we talk about them and you think about them in relationship to TWIM, in relationship to your practice, okay? What is it that you are seeing? You are getting and learning Dana Sila Bhavana first. And then you're learning Silisama Dipanya. And this Sila is including the Donna at that point because the Donna Sila Bhavana is just to get the Donna rolling, to open the heart and to have it ready for the meditation, to keep it open within the Sila in the Sila Samadhi Panya. Samadhi, tranquil wisdom, tranquil wisdom meditation. That's what we're looking at. And the purification of virtue for the sake of reaching purification of mind. And we all who are here tonight, the students that were here earlier, we did some exercises and we find out overcoming the hindrances are by letting them go, not taking them personally, letting them be and coming back and remembering all the time that when we let them go, we relax, smile, and come back each time. And that opens our mind enough, sharpens our awareness, and keeps smiling, keeps to sharpen the awareness. Purification of mind for the, for the, for the sake of reaching purification of you, understanding and defining the nature of the five aggregates of five is the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. How these are the being, how they're operating in conjunction with the 37 requisites of enlightenment, how they're operating, connected with getting through knowledge and vision with clear understanding of the impersonal nature of everything. Purification of view for the purpose of overcoming doubt. Doubt shakes us up. When we first come, when we first start to practice, someone said to me earlier, I can't go. I know I, I might not, I might not succeed. <laughs> That's okay. If you go halfway, you went halfway. Next time you come, you'll go three quarters of the way. The next time you'll come, you'll go further and stay with the object longer. Nobody's pushing you in anything that we're doing. 30 minutes minimum for your sitting. Increasing your time. Five minutes a shot. You say to the mind, okay, I, I know I want to get up. <laughs> you speak to yourself, but I'm going to stay five minutes longer. Okay, says my, okay, I'll let you stay. Okay, fine. <laughs> At the end of the five minutes, you say, his mind says, okay, get up now. No, I, I'm going to stay five minutes long. Now you just added 10 minutes. You tricked him. This little two-year-old up here in your head. You tricked him. <laughs> and now you added 10 minutes. I watch it happen in retreats. The next time you get excited because you added 10 minutes, you add 20. 
And that's how it builds. But each time you're getting more confident, you're getting sharper, you'll be able to watch more easily and let things go, let it go, relax, smile, come back. Don't resist these hindrances. Why? Why not let them just pull them, pull away from them and come straight back? Why not? Because you won't go deeper, because you slow yourself down, because there's nothing personal about these at all. There's no information in them at all. And a Nietzsche tells you the law. And the law is it will arise, be there, and pass away. But as it arises, there's something to learn. And that makes it the teacher. And you're learning, how does it come up? Did I make it come up? No. Does it belong to me? No. Is it part of me? No. Can I make it stay and look at it? <laughs> you can try, but you won't be meditating. So anybody who goes over there and stays with it and tries to examine it or analyze it has now changed meditation practices. And that's what I tell my students at retreats. If you went over there, if you're sitting for an hour and you're only able to stay with your object of meditation for a minute, what's wrong? That means probably for 30 times you left your object of meditation. Don't you like your change that so that you'll stick around, stay with the person your meditation is to work with the spiritual friend and then develop it develops from there in our practice the object of meditation will change as you go through your development purification of overcoming doubt for the sake of reaching the knowledge and vision of what the path is and what the path is not. And the, what's happening there is you, you know you're moving along. And if you're trying something where you're not moving along, something's wrong. According to the Buddha, something's wrong. He set it up with perfect instructions. If we go back and read them again, just be flexible enough to open your mind and unlock your mind to considering maybe they didn't quite get it in translation quite right. Maybe we have to just change a little bit of how we're looking at these instructions and we go. That's what's fun and that's what's real. And why shouldn't it be that way? There's no reason it shouldn't be that way. 2,600 years old instructions. There's no reason why it shouldn't be off a little bit after 2,600 years. Knowledge and vision, the correct discrimination of the, uh, this is the other part that they, they talk about in the notes, as I said before, was the correct discrimination between the false path and of the, the false path they're talking about, it's not moving. You get hooked and craving and clinging to the ecstatic Buddhism that they have and the exhilarating experiences of bliss and want to sit in bliss. And people write books now about bliss is the Nibbana. The ecstatic stuff is the Nibbana. No, it's not. No. And the true path of the insight is determining Anicca Dukkha Nata. And you're doing that every time you do the six steps, the six R's. Purification of knowledge. It, we're doing this one in preparation for purification of knowledge and vision of the way. Meaning if you under, you let go of all these things, let them go and look at what's left, you begin to see how the pieces of the Eightfold Path are affecting and operating for the meditation to work. And then the purification of knowledge and vision of the way is in preparation or, or for the sake of reaching Nibbana. And earlier we said, what I, I don't know, we should talk about this. Anybody has any comments about it, but my own feeling, we know that the state of Nibbana is an unconditioned state. We can't say anything about the Nibbana because the whole entire language we're trying to talk to each other with is a concept, language. 
if I say shoe, you have to tell me what the shoe is. Is it the laces or the tongue or the frame or the foot? Or is it the pad or the inner pad? Or the, what is the shoe? The automobile, the same thing. Our whole language is like that, not just objects like that. Try to say I, well, that's a concept, just me. <laughs> Try to say you, well, that's the concept. We, that's a concept. Try to say, uh, I did it with the articles, a, and, and the. And they're all three concepts with how talking about an unconditioned state that you're describing the state with a conditional language is impossible. But we can talk about what isn't there the tension and tightness is gone. The feeling of craving of pulling us or pushing us is gone. The body is totally turned off and then turned on to come back up to experience the opening. And that's what it feels like. It feels like a bud that is coming up out of the water and is just going to go and bloom into a lotus and open up, it's an opening of the mind. Okay, comments, anybody? We got about 10 minutes here. Comments, questions? Boy, must've been a good reading. <laughs> you really, this, I don't know what this is doing with the light, but now I'm bright red. <laughs> this is really funny. I don't know what does that. There I come, okay. I don't have any front light right now, so it's kind of interesting. Anybody have any questions on this one? Uh, Sister Kima, yeah. I have a question for you. So you said Nibbana is like a concept. Can it be that, you know, the, all the seven stages that has been described, purification of virtue, purification of mind and uh, purification of view, purification of overcoming doubt and right. then you know the purification by knowledge and vision yeah. of what is the path what is not the path of the way and purification by knowledge and vision that the holy life is lived can all of it be you know uh, like how you said the automobile is not just one thing the whole automobile is a lot of parts like that right. can nibbana be all of these? No. Nope. <laughs> this is what's wonderful. These things take you to the door. To right. enter, these things have now become in you. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. If we look at each one of them, look at each one of them. I did this earlier because I was doing the same thing you're doing. Let's look at each one of them to Purification of virtue is what? It's a giving up, giving up, giving up, right? Purification of mind, giving up the hindrances, abandonment, right? Purification of view, giving up me. And taking everything. Uh, and per, and let the next one, overcoming doubt. Doubt was grabbing you, grabbing you, disturbing you. It's a giving up, abandonment, right? Knowledge and vision of what the path is and what the path is not. What is the path is not doing anything and giving up to get there, to get to the brink of going over the way I show you in the chart when I show you the waterfall picture. Yes. Yes. Has anybody here not seen the waterfall picture? <laughs> anybody has not seen it? Okay. The waterfall is just the eight, it's just the eight levels that you're going through to fall over into the ninth one. So if we were to look at it, that's what this is reminding me of uh, pretty clearly is, is um, oops, I have to go get my little, I have to go get my, I have to go get my pen. Wait a second. I can't do it without my pen. Yeah, you know, 
You know, Perel, the Perel, the interesting thing about this is a lot of people think they don't want to try Buddhism because they look at it from the perspective of, well, I don't want to get involved with this because there's so many parts. I remember my my um, my cousin was the same age as my mom. I was talking to her about this and she said, I tried to look at that one. She's a philosopher major, a philosophy major at uh, Vanderbilt College, you know, and she said, I didn't want to touch it. There are just, every time there was a, a section like, for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the five pieces of um, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom, the faculties, then they're going to talk to me about powers. And then they're going to talk to me four of this and five of this and six of this, and I can't take it. She was a wreck and she threw it away never went any further, never invested. She looked at it as everything was being piled up on top of me to become interested in Buddhism, where other philosophers were talking about discovering a new way to look at the world. I don't see the point, she said, because she was frightened. How? Frightened of the pieces, all this stuff. And she had enough stuff she wanted to get rid of and never realized that time I couldn't tell her I didn't know. You see it's too bad she's gone now. <laughs> okay, but when what we're talking about is giving giving up giving up now watch what even happens when we talk about the waterfall. Um, we do it this way we start with a pond and then it goes like this and we say it's springtime and the rains are coming. And we draw this funny little thing like this, okay? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we put cessation down here. And then what happens is you come out, you see the parts of the dependent origination turning back on when you come back up. And then here is where Nibbana is here. It's like that. That's like a star. It's a big explosion. This is Nibbana here. So this is a, and number one, it's an experience. It's an experience. We have books today from very well-trained monks, okay, telling us that it's reaching the city of Nibbana. And we have another one, the country of Nibbana, the place, you know, out here of Nibbana. They ha haven't actually had, they went through the training and looked through the Vasudhimaga and came out with this thing, we're going to Nibbana. Well, even to go on vacation, you know, I had five kids. I've told you that <laughs> one time I said, we're going on vacation. You can each bring a friend. That was 10 kids and two adults. It was insanity, but we had five tents and we put them in a circle and pretended we were an Indian tribe, okay? But let me tell you, it was not an easy thing to take a journey like that to go somewhere. So again, these people are caught with the idea, look at all this, how hard we have to work and know all this. And then we have to keep it on us to get there, like it's parts of the car. But what happens is up here, okay, this is full of water. And when this gets full of water, it begins to move down because it goes by gravity. And this is the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. And then you have the fourth jhana sections of infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and the little guy who wants the big name, neither perception nor non-perception, big shot, okay. <laughs> and then you have cessation, here's cessation. Now, in the old school, remember I told you guys before, in the old school, it goes like this, and these four slide over and they are subsections of the fourth jhana. And these are mental states here, and the other states are um, rupa. They are rupa, uh, um, the rupa states and the arupa states. So these are mental, meaning there's no body. These are arupa states. And these are the rupa jhanas, okay? And it just means you have your body for most of this, but right about here, um, you know, right about here, 
is where you lose your body. You start losing it, right? At the third jhana, that's the degree where you start to lose the, the feeling in the body. Some in, in one and two, you kind of fly through them. Not you're going through them very pretty fast. You have to listen. If you if you haven't done it, if you're listening now, you go to the YouTube and you find Vimala Ramsey, Bhante Vimala Ramsey, and find. Uh, Majima Nikaya number 111 and you listen to the description of these levels and what is happening to you as you go through these levels so that you before you go on the trip this is not illegal uh, you at home you would call the AAA instead of calling the AAA what we did was we went to MN uh, 111 AAA would give you a map, tell you what you're going to see on the way and what's going to happen so you'd know in advance how long it's going to take you to get from the East Coast to the West Coast in the United States. Well, this one is the Anupada, Anupada Sutta, and, and this is the one that describes Sarikuta's practice, which is what we're doing. We're trying to see, we were trying, we were, we were trying to see in the beginning what if we if we follow these directions very carefully without changing anything, would it work? That's all we were doing. Same thing you guys are doing, testing, testing. But our game was, let's go back to the text themselves. Anything we're doing that has to do with the commentary, let it go just to see what would happen because they weren't written yet for two or 300 years until he, after he was gone. So let's just go back to the lessons he taught the monks make friends with them. We, when we listened to him talk about this at first, we thought it would be very hard, okay? But it's no harder than going to study Shakespeare and getting used to listen to Shakespeare. If you listened to me teach this one tonight and read it to you, it wasn't that hard to listen to it. You just need to get used to the way that the, what the suttas are set up. And when you, when you think about how, they're, how are they set up, you know, they're set up like this, uh, according to the Four Noble Truths, these sutras are all set up this way. And so the first thing you're going to hear about is that somebody's suffering, okay, and they're coming to the Buddha. And then he's, then he's going to question, where's the cause? And he's going to point that out. And then he's going to show where a cessation can happen. We saw this in this one, okay? And then he's going to show you the way to the cessation, Okay, to the cessation. That's what he's going to do. And almost all the suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya, the ones that are about the meditation, they're all set up this way. And so you get suffering and cause and cessation, or you get suffering and cessation, or you just hear about cessation. And the big thing to remember in Buddhism is, did the Buddha give you a gift? Did he, did he protect and preserve a gift for you? Okay, what was the gift? We can we go the Four Noble Truths. Yeah, okay, but this is the one I want to hear about. I want to hear about this one. I want to hear about this one. That was the one that he gave you, cessation of suffering. If you listen to his exact precise instructions and just do it until you can get the results that are described in the same sutta you're looking at, and that's what you're trying to do. The results are there. And believe me, they're pretty accurate. It's pretty shocking. They are pretty accurate, okay? So test it until you get to that point, okay? Now, this one, we're showing you the water. It comes down into when it gets, the springtime gets here and the water comes over. That's how the first jhana happens. And once you have the joy arise in the first jhana, you're working in the first jhana and you just relax and keep watching. This is filling up. Now, what are these little things? Well, if you go and hike and you get to a waterfall, if you examine it, wherever the water's coming down, there is a pothole underneath the waterfall. There is a pothole. And that's this piece right here. That's the pothole. And it's coming down from the water, pounding it. And the second one is not the second waterfall. It doesn't happen until what? Until this stuff goes over after it fills up. 
That's how you're going through the jhanas. How fast you go through is how well can you abandon anything that comes up and believe that you just has nothing for you and just leave it alone and smile at it and keep going. So how fast can you decide to do that and really believe these rules that he gave us, these laws that he taught us about it? Okay, and then this one rolls over and it falls in here. By then, you're going to lose some feeling in your hands and in your feet, then your legs and then your arms. Eventually, your whole torso will disappear. And that's where you're going down now into the fourth jhana, right? Okay. And then things happen down here. But I'm telling you, go for yourself and see Arupa jhana, MN111. Okay. So this is how the waterfall works. And it just keeps doing this. It keeps going like this and filling up. And as long as you're abandoning things, this is, this is the conditional thing. As long as you're abandoning things and you're letting go and just watching what's happening inside and you keep smiling and relaxing your head. What's so important about my head? Your head is the command center. It's the command center for your whole body. You want to relax sometime, relax your head. Let go of all your thoughts. Just be very calm and just let them fall out your ears and fall out everywhere <laughs> and just fall out on the pillow and go away for the night. If you want to practice that's really silly, when you come home and if you have a sweater or you have a, a shawl, make sure you have a shawl in the car. You put it on, you walk in the house, you take the shawl off, you hang it on a hook. Inside the shawl are all the thoughts you had, all the worries you had, everything. Hang it on the hook by the door, then go in the house for the evening. Don't think about anything, just smile. Oh, I gotta tell you what happened today, oh my gosh. And you're there, yeah, what happened? Okay, tell me, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that right? The washing machine leaked on the floor and I got to fix the faucets in the downstairs. Okay, fine. It'll take a little time, but you know, Anicca. <laughs> Always make yourself a flag, put it on the wall. Anicca. That's the one. People tell me now I'm promoting Anicca. I think I'm going to make some flags. Anicca. And I'm going to sell them to raise money for this temple. <laughs> I can, you know, stay here. You know, we send you little flags and then it goes over when it falls down. It's like, it's more like this when it falls down. Let's show you. It's more like, here we go, right here. Something happens right here. And it's like you hit a wall and, but it really turns off perception, thoughts and consciousness, perception, feeling consciousness off. It's just off. And where it's falling to is cessation. And then what happens, it's very short the first time it happens. And when it comes back on also, it seems like it's pretty fast the first time it comes on, unless you've been very relaxed at giving away, giving away. That's the measuring stick. How fast does this happen? How fast does this part happen? Down here, how far does this happen? fast the first time with turning off and turning back on is directly proportional to how were you letting things abandon, just abandon this, abandon everything, abandon it, let them go, let them go, let them go. If you're doing that all the way through this path, then this is going to get the next time when you continue to work, it's going to be there what the, the shut off will happen the same way, the drop off, but coming back on will be clearer and clearer. The first time you might not notice anything, the, but most people notice something, you know, and the second time you see these just as dots. And then the third time, maybe they're like little dashes like that when they come back on. And eventually they're pretty clear when they're coming back on because you understand what's happening and you're not, you're, you're not shocked. You know what's happening. You're turning back on and you're confident nothing's going to happen to you. So the more often that you do this, eventually you learn how to sit in cessation and then come out. But the cessation you're sitting in for longer periods of time is a little bit different than this, this blackout. It's not a blackout. I want to point this out. A blackout is different. This one is turning off. A blackout is a blackout and come back. 
nothing new, nothing changes. This is different. So this is what we're talking about when we are talking about the, um, the, the screening. I am sharing, okay, stop sharing, okay. That's what we're talking about when we're trying to show you what's happening as we're going down the path, okay? But it's a good question what you ask. It's a very good question. And you see, that's next question. See, I have long answers. <laughs> I never know who's in the room. The reason when I was reading this to you and I always said craving and clinging, why was that? Because who's in the room that doesn't know anything about dependent origination? If somebody's here that doesn't know about the dependent origination, they need to hear that craving and clinging are what is stopping, not just clinging. See, that's why Bonte does that when he puts the craving in with the clinging. And the question, sometimes you'll see, uh, you will see a sutta that has it in there meaning he is definitely teaching monks that don't know a lot about the dependent origination. Other times you'll see the sutta where it only says clinging and we're not sure what, whether there was anybody around or just the, he's saying it just because the people who understand dependent origination very well are there. So why just, just say clinging, you see, okay? Anybody else question? I'll try to learn how to do short answers. <laughs> I mean, this whole this whole business this whole business of of, of stopping things, you know. Um, for example, in, in 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 practical life, you know, I I, I had an, an experience. I think it was this past week where where suddenly I find myself in an argument with someone, you know, not, not a bad argument, but just kind of like an exchange where I know this is leading to, you know, this is my opinion and the other person says, oh, this is my opinion. And I'm like, you might be right. You know, you might be right about that. And I stopped it and that was it, no more. It's like, well, thank you for recognizing that. Yeah, it's okay. And that was it, that was the end. That was this, this that was the ending of that situation. So it, it, this all reminds me, like this process, I mean, obviously meditation is a process where you're doing it on your own, but it's like, how does that translate into actual life? You know, where do you yeah. stop this thing, right? Right, that's right, yeah. I've heard you tell me that you're using this more and I'm very pleased with it because I know you're faced with some things where you are with the cut, you know, of the cutting down of the, uh, the funding for what you're doing almost in half because of everything that's happened. And it's very hard to see this happen and then be faced with, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> it's not always easy to say, okay, fine. But I, this, when I get caught now, yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is something that, that I think is being, is becoming uh, contagious to my to my colleagues because I started preaching the 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 gospel of letting go and like it's okay it we will be okay it's okay we will get through this one day at a time one hour at a time that's okay it's okay and now it's funny because I hear my colleagues who are not Buddhists at all you know they're like yeah it's okay this will pass too one hour at a time <laughs> it's okay and so this is how the team you know, I mentioned the team earlier, you know, like the team is a very good team. It's a very strong team. So it's a, it's a leaner team because now instead of eight people, I mean, 10 people, now we have five, but we are very secure in what we're doing because it, it permeates it. Eventually people begin to catch on like, oh, this is the way to go. You know, we don't have to worry so much about what's going to happen next. We just do one thing at a time. You know, you know, because you're a musician, I have to tell you this, I can see you at the next meeting and when everybody's about to object and they've all been exposed to this, you say, okay, okay, everybody line up. Okay, take each other's arms. Okay, now we're going to do it. Don't worry, be happy. Because every little thing is going to be all right. See, there we go. Once more, don't worry, be happy. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Okay, sit down. Let's do the meeting. 
<laughs> try that see what happens i mean you know most of the people you're working with they're artists they're musicians they're people who were musical and now they're coming into different forms of teaching especially if you have people fighting in the class where the teachers are the mu te you know, the music teachers but i don't know how it's going to work i don't know okay everybody line up don't worry be happy because every little thing is going to be all right. Now they're going to get me this nun. She's singing again. What are we going to do? <laughs> Maria's not supposed to be in the Abbey. <laughs> okay. Just let right. her sing. Let her sing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that stuff. You know, I'm sorry. You know, it's just life. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? One of the things I was talking to somebody the other day, they said, well, how did this all get messed up? And I said, listen to me. I was in Sri Lanka. They were taking these boys in when they were seven or eight years old. The parents couldn't keep all the children and they took them in to make them little monks. And then I had a monk come to the mountain. He was 20 years old. He never saw a movie in his life. Never went to the movies his whole life in 20 years. And Bhante says, take him to see a movie. <laughs> so I took him to see Fantasia. But <laughs> Walt Disney's Fantasia was playing. I, and he was like sitting in the front, you know, near the front row, like, oh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> His mouth was open. He wouldn't know what to do with himself. He never saw anything so beautiful. And these are people that are going to tell everybody how to do the Sigilavata Sutta and live their life in lay life but they're not in touch, you know, unless they have enough exposure. Somehow we got to get them to have a little more exposure to understand that uh, what is going on in lay life. Because some of them, they now somebody who comes in at 18, uh, 16 or 18, that's different. And they decide, you know, they decide they're going to go, you know what, this is my battery. We're going to have to quit. Mm, what am I going to do now? Um, I don't know. <laughs> okay, reboot. Wait a second. <laughs> I know what happened. I'm coming. Wait, I know, I know. <laughs> mm. Yeah, let's see. I'm not sure what can happen. I got cut off. <laughs> so I had to run to get seen. the plug because there's no plugs in that room. <laughs> Funny. All right. Huh? <laughs> yes, right. Don't worry. Be happy as everything's going to be all right. <laughs> hey, listen. Um, you know, uh, you did. I you all took a turn. I didn't tell you what's going really well is uh, that uh, 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 we had a rainstorm and the roof it didn't leak <laughs> and the water is turned on and everything works. So this is a very good thing. Okay. So are you all with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, we need to adjourn. I think it's probably time. I don't have the clock now. This isn't fair. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it is two hours now. Huh? Okay, wait a minute. Sarah had a question. Sarah, do you want a question? Oh yes, just a little, okay. a little one. <laughs> okay, go. Go for it. But quite a big one, actually. Um, okay. Yeah. Could you say a little bit more again about uh, cessation and the and a blackout and the difference between them? Uh, I would say the difference, Bhante Dhamma Kavesi can comment on this too, but I would say the, the basic difference in, uh, as a, a guide what, watching the person report is, you know, well, just everything stopped and I don't know what happened. And then we ask, uh, we watch the person and then the person has no change at all in their experience, no change in eyesight, hearing, nothing's changed at all. That's a blackout. And one of the things Bonte will say about blackouts to me, uh, I heard him many times say the blackout happens because of over-concentration. A lot of it is too much one-pointedness and then the mind shuts, drops. 
then you you come back wow it was a blackout but let's not get really excited about a blackout it's not the same thing as cessation because when cessation happens it only happens when the mind is cleared out it's like mm -hmm. uh, did you sweep this morning did you remember to vacuum and did you do the mopping of the floor and disinfectant you've done it with your mind and this sutta was talking about the purifications are clear but not maybe permanently okay but to reach cessation it was abandon 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 and if you abandon enough and let go and this is what's contradictory because you're hearing people say sit down work hard be serious point 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 nothing happens if it was correct let's be benevolent here if it was correct where are the attainments? It's been 150 years of doing that way and you don't hear about them. You don't, they're not talked about, they're not there, see? So the real question is um, what's happening? And there are a few, there are a few people that have significant changes in their lives and stuff, but we don't get to talk to them uh, about, I've talked to a few of them, but it's marginal and it's not permanent, it's for periods of time after retreats and stuff, and then it's gone. And what we're looking for is, is, uh, is um, actual change in the personality reasoning, the stories. You know, if you read um, David, if you read, um, right, Mark's book, his okay. section, the stories that are in his book of the people who uh, went through and their experiences uh, and some of the ones that I recounted to him that he included in there. Those are ma major changes in these people in their lives. And we had one not very long ago that I wanna just take her name and say, this is her book <laughs> and just make a little book and put it out there because it's just absolutely dazzling the changes with her parents with the people living in the lockdown with the way she handles people at work where her sleep patterns have changed where she doesn't need so much sleep where her depression is laughed at and let go and changed just like that she knows how to if it feels that way coming to let go and go she knows the feeling of the depression is very interesting because you have all these different levels of depression and you have like these 10 levels of depression you work with, with the, um, uh, what do they say? Ma not manic depressive. What am I looking for, Perel, the term? Um, but you you know, there's different depression. Bipolar. Thank you, bipolar disorder. Boy, big one. <laughs> bipolar disorder, you're looking at 10 different levels of people and the one, one and two, they dismiss it and say another, another title for it and don't even say the person's bipolar. Okay. Two, three, four. Um, the cyclothymic. Yes. They call it cyclothymic. Right. And then when you say three, four, two, three, four, five, even take your meds and come and see me and you realize what's happening and you need your meds. Okay. But then we can train you to uh, make an agreement with your doctor is the way I like to handle it, point blank. Go to your doctor, find one that will agree with you to work on reduction of it if you don't want the side effects and work together at a reduction because you increase your management knowledge for depression. But I'm not gonna say to you, meditate and no more meds because I worked in advocacy for four years and I really understand the stuff. And, and the thing about it is people who haven't been depressed, they don't realize that if a person comes and they've crashed and show up and you realize you're a depressive disorder and they give you the stabilizing drugs, do not fool around with the stabilizing drugs without a doctor with you because you're gonna get really heartbroken if you cut yourself off and crash. And always remember one thing, you were weaned off. You have to weaned off. What you do what happens, you can't ever use it again, right?
right, Perel? You know, this is like, um, the, um, this is very serious because we can't, we, we have to be careful how we, we talk about this. And sometimes I talk about it more severely because I was in advocacy and worked with all different levels of people. And um, this was legally helping people, but I saw what happened if uh, a lot of times the trouble they got into was as a result of, I'm sick of the drugs, sick of the side effects. They didn't have a good communication with the doctor, cut the drug, had problems. That's what, that's what'll happen. That's not a good thing. You need, you can't learn what we're teaching you if you're not here. And the, and the drugs themselves are stabilization first, then learning the management work that if the doctor isn't there, you can climb out of the hole. You have a way of doing that by learning how the depression rises and starts to feel, and then you counter it, like in, in the human kind number two. You counter it by the, the, uh, the you counter the um, effect of what's happening to you by the reversal in your mind, and then it will fade out. It gives you a place to go. But to say to you, stop doing this when you're depressed, this is not good. You see, just to say, stop doing that is not an answer. And we can help you if you're, you're working uh, with something, with a good cooperative uh, psychiatrist or, or, or psychologist, we can help you to learn this. But again, you work with the person who's uh, monitoring your case and not, uh, not in defiance, you see? And good ones, they will work with you. And yes, there's some Hitlers out there, <laughs> you know, but they want to make you do everything. But, but there's also some really good relationships out there. I worked with a, a, gr a different group twice, two different groups in uh, Central Virginia. They were wonderful with their, with their uh, consumers. Very wonderful with the people who were going through this. So my heart is with that, you know, it's why I talk about it so openly, because it was such a joy to be able to help them understand. Anybody else? One more, one more and we got to go. <laughs> okay, you ready? We're going to say our prayer. Okay. Now I have to now I have to run in the other room to ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> I left the bell in the other room. <laughs> okay, here we go. Ready? May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless. the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired with the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting the earth, devas and gods, may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Okay.